make our way towards the Eastland Disaster Memorial, which is where most of the victims are buried. And as we make our way there, we can walk and look at some of the other graves here at Bohemian National Cemetery, many of which have pictures. And as we go, I'll tell you the story about what happened. Of course, it was on July 24, 1915 that this disaster happened. And let's start by talking about the ship itself. The ship was in size about 275 feet long and it was only at that length, about the length of a football field, about 38 feet wide. And it was actually built for the city of South Haven to attract tourists to come over there. The idea being that you would get out of the dusty, dirty city and climb aboard the Eastland from the docks of the Chicago River which in the day was completely nasty and polluted. And from those conditions in three hours, you could tour across the lake, Lake Michigan, and depending on weather conditions, arrive in South Haven to paradise. However, the ship was designed with no real safety considerations considering considering what was available at the day at least it was a dangerous ship to start there was a five page contract only five pages to build the ship and it was dominated with the condition that the speed of the ship was the, the key consideration and if the speed issue wasn't met then they could walk away from the contract. Now there were three levels in the ship. The lowest deck had the cabins and it had nice beds, it had bar, staterooms, dance floor, concession stands, a grill. It was beautiful and it had all the accompaniments and just like the Titanic it also had a promenade deck. An unbelievable area to view and observe that around you from the water. The steamship experience was like a floating city and with that with the staterooms and with the vices you would even see children at the bar drinking. It was very it was very festive and laid back. Not a lot of rules. It had a big organ. I think it was called a calliope. And it was a steam-based organ that would play from the deck. And it was unbelievably loud. And anyone who came down the river, everyone would come out of the buildings to see the Eastland. And by the way, as you look at the Eastland, you just can tell something's wrong. It's a, like a floating top-heavy cigarette. That's my own term. The organ was actually banned by the city after a while because it was so loud and people would stop working and it was completely disruptive. So, But it was on a, a cold, gray, rainy day and if you look at the ship, it's hard to imagine, but there were 2,500 people on board this ship. And there were 100 crew. And what happened was, for circumstances unknown, it had to do with a balancing problem and people moving around. Now let me just say, the, sh the ship to start with was built by a company that was more into industrial freighters 
and not passenger. And the plumbing was bad, the design was bad, and the, a big part of the plumbing was to get ballasting, and that's, that's what really balances a ship. They actually will bring water in, kind of like a submarine. Submarine wants to sink though, and they will totally, they won't totally sink the ship like a submarine, but they will, will bring the water in to partially sink the ship to different sides and places to correct any weight and balance issues to make sure that the, the ship remains fairly level. And it was a really bad system. And you combine that with the lack of safety. Now, there was a previous incident that happened. I don't remember where it was on the other side, I think at Grand Haven or Michigan City, where the ship came out. And it started like wallowing, almost tipping over. And it stopped. And then slowly it righted itself. And it might have been. They did get the ballasting done in time. It may not have been, but it scared the heck out of a lot of passengers. And one guy, he took the train home. He would not get back on that ship. No way. So there were warning signs, but the owners didn't care. It was all of the usual thing, all about money, all about speed and the usual thing. So on that fateful day, they were planted there at the dock. They were tied to the dock. And for some reason, people were on deck and they all went to one side. And then they went to the other side and the ship was, was tipping one way and they were down below working and got it semi-corrected but then they all ran to the other side and that's when it started to roll and it kept rolling and it just rolled over. Now you just have to imagine that there are people below deck there, and there's a dance, there's a bar, they're dancing, they're getting ready for their dream trip. It was Western Electric Company, most people, it was kind of a company outing, not kind of, it was a company outing to take everybody across the lake. And all of a sudden, can you imagine being on the dance floor but down below and all of a sudden, and at first they thought it was funny. They were dancing, they thought, oh, let's slide down the floor. This is kind of cool. Little did they know that it would keep going. And the rest is history. Everybody was trapped inside. There was a staircase that they all funneled to and they all, most of them died at this, this funnel point. And imagine the ship was sideways, so the stairs and the railings were sideways. It's pretty much impossible, impossible to get out. Women were screaming, men are running for life preservers, but it really didn't do any good. Luckily, there was a, a man named Joseph Erickson who was the chief engineer on the Eastland. And it's kind of like Casey Jones as a hero manning his post. He literally kept working the ballast trying to fix the situation. Isn't that sad, by the way, that the rocks from the lawnmowers could have hit any other place and that really beautiful picture but can't see what he looked like and he literally stood there as the water was rising to his knees then to his chest then to his neck and all the way up to his nose and then if that wasn't enough while the other crew members were scattering like rats to get out he got a rope 
went below as far as he could to get people out. And he saved mostly children. And by the way, skipping forward, he was put on trial and Clarence Darrow represented him. And that's a little bit you can get into the story. It's a great story. Here is a young woman in her 30s, low 30s it looks like. Sure. Can't really get a lower angle on that. So it's pandemonium. Everyone is nowhere to go. Can you imagine? Dark. And everyone was inside, by the way, because it was cold and rainy outside. It's too bad people weren't on the promenade. There's a little boy. So all those people died there, and as you looked into the river, you could see bo bodies, you could see people flailing. I mean, everyone was dressed to the, to the max. They had, they were going to a costume parade there across the lake, so they were all dressed up for this big giant picnic that they were gonna have. And there was going to be food and a parade, and the men were in their suit coats and straw hats, and the women had beautiful dresses, and all the kids, and by the way, a lot of kids died, were all in their little best outfits. We are right in the flight path of O'Hare. Unfortunately, and all you could see in the river were bodies and people flailing, screaming, baby strollers bobbing, one man jumping in, bringing one at a time, saving lives, but most people just stood there gawking. Didn't help. Just had their jaws dropped. Of course, all the people were, with, after the few heroics, people were laid out in the morgue. And then came the gruesome task of identifying the bodies. And of course, the ship executives got the best lawyers. And Erickson, he got no defense. That's why, well, at first, he, as I mentioned, he got no defense, and then Clarence Darrow, as a charity case, God rest his soul, came in and defended him. And it is probably because of Clarence Darrow that these executives got off, the owners, because of what an amazing lawyer he was. And of course, Erickson got off. He, he was really the hero in this tragic story. There is one little boy that we're going to see who was one of the very last victims to be identified. They call him the little feller the little feller, seven years old, Willie. He was finally, he was dressed in all white, by the way, and he was finally identified by his, two of his friends, the little boys, little schoolmates, playmates, had to come 
and identify him. Can you imagine the rest of your life you would remember that picture in your mind of little Willie? Yeah, they call them the little feller. The people at the morgue. And we're going to visit his grave. And by the way, we are in the process of buying him a tombstone. Faces of the Forgotten, congrats guys, way to go. Patreon, PayPal, donations, we've got enough to buy him. Little Willie, a gravestone, and it is not far from Eliska Perubek, who bought tombstones last year for her parents, two, two tombstones. And maybe we'll take a quick look to see how they're doing. So we are coming up on the Eastland Disaster Memorial, which you see up here. So many young people. 1917. Okay, we have arrived at the memorial. Let's take a look. Here you see this area. This is where many of them are buried. Let's take a look. See the date 1915 and you know what that means. Here is William Sherry and Emily Samick. Sad to say they were engaged to be married and they both perished that fateful day. The families buried them here together and Emily was a, she was an employee of the Western Electric Company and William came along to be with her. And now they're together forever in death. There ahead is the two statues, husband and wife, I had done some earlier videos of them. I've done some stuff in this area, but we didn't really, we really didn't touch on the victims that much. And we didn't tell the story, so I thought it would be good to circle back. But isn't this an amazing? Pair of statues. Is that what he looked like? Probably.
Emil Zek, beloved husband. I'll tell you, this disaster wiped a lot of families out. A lot of families. Francisek Vavra. Twenty year old twenty year old clerk for Western Electric. Only twenty years old when he died. Dreaming of that trip across the lake. He was below decks, I'm sure. Here are three young sisters who are buried together. Anna, Rose, and Marie. And I have their pictures I will show. Age 20, 19, and 17. Very sad. This is their cousin, Yosef. He was with them. You can see here the parents Anton and Ant Antoni. Matka's mother, Otekka's father, and it is interesting to note that he died in 1916. And I will make a presumption, a good one, I'm sure, that he died of heartbreak, maybe a heart attack, the stress of losing his son. Here is the grave of Rosina. They called her Rose. She was 16 to 17 years old. They, they don't know. But she was employed as a typist. Here is another family. This family was completely wiped out. Husband, wife, brother, sister, kids, son, daughter, Mosna. Katerina, all together when they died. And by the way, it, it wiped out several families. And not only that, the, it wiped out lineages lineages of people. Zian. And here the brother sister. Rosina, many times they went by Rose and the brother. I think she was nineteen or twenty one. I'll have to look. Back here. Yes, she was 21 and she went by Rose. And her brother here was 17 years old. Looks like a younger picture of him, but he was 17.
there are lots here. There, there, there are many people in this section. Here's another one. I'm not sure if Anna died, but it says 1915. I did look her up. I couldn't find her in the victims list, but maybe you guys check. I mean, what's the coincidence that she's here and she died in 1915? She must have. There's a good chance she was part of it. I'll take a picture of the stone. I'd be interested to know. Anna Fort is here. Her maiden name, I believe, was Sukup, daughter of John and Marie, but I see other names here. She died at 17 years old. And I, I see two pictures and both named Anna, so I'm really confused. Perhaps we can sort this out. So this is, they're both died together, perhaps sisters. So often in the communion dresses, again, as I mentioned before, they didn't have a lot of cameras running around in those days. And many times the only picture a woman would have is of her communion or her wedding or her postmortem. Once in a while you see that. But in the day, women would also give pictures to, they would, they would do portraits to give to men, suitors. All right, we are going to now go to the grave of little Willie. We're on the opposite side of the cemetery now, on the southeast side, and we're going to walk a short distance to the grave of Little Willie, who they nicknamed the Little Feller. And I'll tell you more specifically his story as we make our way there. As I said, he was the last victim just about the last victim to be identified as he laid there in the morgue for many days. The police, the morgue people, they all became connected to him. They really wanted to find out who he was, the family. Yeah, I'm going to read to you the article that came out in the paper. And it started by saying, So the small body to which tag 396 was attached, the little feller, policeman called it, was identified yesterday. The little feller was Willie Navadny, who started in Holiday Best Saturday morning from his home at 5527 West 24th Place. Two playmates, Willie and Walter Seck, went to Sheldon's undertaking rooms at 912 West Madison Street yesterday to look at Eastland victim for whom all Chicago has been trying to find a name. The little feller was indeed Willie Novotny, but his own uncle doubted that it was him. He did not agree with the identification, but the two boys said, sir, we've been living right next door to him. We was at his birthday party when he turned seven. We used to go to school together and play together every day. 
Get Willie's grandma. She's all that's left of the family. She'll tell you. Well, they did, they did get the grandmother. A Mrs. Agnes Martinak. And she was brought to the undertaker in an automobile. And I'm reading on, it says, despite the, the grandeur of her presence, she was crying. She unwrapped a parcel and handed it to one of the policemen, and it had a small pair of brown knickerbockers, which were never worn. She said, if it's Willie, he's got these pants on, just like these. It was a new suit he was going to the picnic in, and he had two pairs of these pants, which came together. This is the identical pair of knickerbockers right here. Well, they went back there and the, the knickerbockers were identical. Victim 396 was indeed Willie Novotny. Now there are no more Novotnys in West 24th place, for Willie's father, mother, and sister were among the first taken by divers from the Eastland hull. They died inside the hull. Number 396, with the name The Little Feller, and with all the flowers sent by the sympathetic piled about him, he is no better off. Charity will have to bury him. Maybe they'll bury Willie in the grave with the rest of the Novotnys in the Bohemian Cemetery today. And that's about all that's written. Willie is buried right over here with his family. They were all wiped out, every one of them. He had a sister, an older sister that died before him, before, before the disaster. They were a family of five. And it was Lily Novotny who was seven years old in 1912 that had died. But here they all are laid to rest. There is only the stone with the name Rodina Novotny. And I'm gonna put a picture of the configuration so that everyone can see, but little Willie is buried right here to the left the lower left here. And up above, up above here to the, the left is Lily, as I said, was seven years old. But the family here is all buried right here in front of my feet. Next to Willie, who's again here on the left, there is his father, James, 34 years old. And to the right of James, straight in front of us, is his mother, Agnes, 34 years old. And to the right is Mamie, who was 10 years old, who was, who was killed. So they're all here, and we are getting a stone. Maybe, maybe someday we'll get stones for the whole family. But for now, we're going to get a stone for Willie right here with his picture. And hopefully people can come and put flowers. It's going to take, unfortunately, it'll take, they said, four to five months for, for the stone to come. It's, it's going to match the gray granite almost exactly. 
and it's it's a it's a good granite. It's very expensive. We have to. I know you can order them on Amazon and things, get them cheaper, but here you have to buy it through the cemetery. The price is the price. I'm not going to quibble. I'm just happy that we're all able to get Willie a marker so that people can come and and uh, pay respects. And I want to thank. I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody on the channel. We have Patreon people that are giving so much. I want to start with them because they pledge monthly. And we have PayPal donations and of course through the live chats and all of that. Everybody's been so generous. Thank you guys. You're all part of this. Thanks to you. Us together we're going to get, get this done. And of course I'll come back and we'll get a picture of uh, some video of when the stone comes in, hopefully by fall, hopefully before the snow flies. And with that, we're gonna close it out here. I'm going to head over to one of the famous monuments that is celebrated here at the cemetery. And I'm gonna go back in time. Uh, take care, everybody.